grandfather's name was Joe Stephen Bonyak. And so he just dropped his last name and everybody ends up with two first names now. <laughs> I, I like your I like your story. Um, yeah, so we are live here. Let me just double check it. Uh, there's always that like little awkward interim. No. No, there we go. Okay, we are in fact live. Awesome. So hey, everybody, this is Victor. Um, uh, we have a very, very, very special guest. That's three varies because he is actually <laughs> extremely uh, special and very well accomplished. Um, and just, you know, excited to share his story. Uh, real quick, before we get into it, comment hashtag live if you're watching this on the Facebook Live. Comment hashtag replay if you're watching the replay. Uh, what that does, it helps build engagement just so the Facebook algorithm picks it up and more people can benefit this. So if you're watching live, hashtag live, hashtag replay, hashtag replay. Uh, but yeah, without further ado, I, just, I want to turn over to the guest here. We have Mitch Steven um, out of Texas and very exciting. He's done over 2,000 deals. Um, he's that's a 2000 2000, by the way, not 200, 2000. It's been this, you know, two decades. Uh, he was telling me he buys a house every week for the last two decades or has bought. Um, so very excited to share uh, him and his story and um, like want to just jump, jump into it and give you guys some, you know, great, great tips here on getting started in real estate. Um, well, how are you doing, Mitch? I'm doing really good and it's a, a pleasure to be here and I appreciate you having me. No, I, I no. Thanks for you know hopping on here. I mean, there's not a lot of people who have done as many deals as you have, and um, you know, just excited to, excited to share your knowledge. I am curious, like, how did you how did you initially get into real estate? Um, I failed at everything else. There was nothing else left, so I had one last thing to try, and if it didn't work, I was just going to jump off a cliff. Uh, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, I failed at a lot of things. It took. I didn't find real estate till I was 34 years old. So I floundered around from, you know, 18 graduated from high school till about, till about 34, trying to figure out who the hell I am and what I'm supposed to do. Uh, and kind of accidentally, I, I just, when I look back, I, I could see what I was doing. It had been a lot better if I'd have done something different, but um, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, what I wanted to do was play football, but I didn't get big enough or fast enough. And I'm actually glad that it didn't work out because you know, there's a lot of problems with that industry, you know, pretty short lifespan, you know, that and being a rock and roll singer. So, um, you know, I started measuring things that I liked and tried to make them happen more often. And I started making notes of things that I disliked or that hurt me that were painful. And I, and I started getting good at avoiding those problems. And one day I owned my, I bought my own condo and, um, from a guy that I served at the bar. I was a bartender and, and he seller financed it to me. And um, long story short, I, I, I sold it and I, and I had more money in the bank than I made in a whole year. If, if I saved every penny I made, I had more money. And I thought, you know, what just happened? Maybe I ought to look into this thing called real estate, you know, maybe that's for me. And I started reading Robert Allen, nothing down books because I didn't have any money. And, and, uh, and, you know, it's funny because I read the book and I understand the concepts. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a dumbass. I mean, I can understand what he says, but, you know, reading a concept and owning the concept in your heart is two different things. You know, you could say you don't need money to be successful in real estate. Yeah, I hear you. And I should believe you because you're a successful guy, but I just, I can't grasp the concept. You know what I mean? So it took me about seven years to actually grasp the concept of that when I accidentally bought a house with no money and made some money. And then I said, oh, that's what Robert Allen's talking about. And then at that moment in time, when I proved the concept accidentally, then all of a sudden I owned the concept and I could buy the whole town now. And then I quit that year and I bought 45 houses from March of 1996 to, um, to the end of the year. In 97, I bought 65 houses. In 98, I bought 150 houses exactly not rounding off. And um, then it kind of just stayed at about 100 houses a year after that, which is really about a house every four to five days, yeah. not even a week. About I, I bought a house every four to five days. And because I did the math, uh -huh. you know, I went and I, I, have, I have the folder of every deal I ever did in the storage someplace, you know what I mean? And I was sent somebody to count the folders. And then I just divided from March of 1996 to where I'm at. And it's, it's every four, every four to five days, I've bought a house. 
or a property yeah. or something. That's amazing. So buying a house, so you're doing like a, a seller finance though, or like, do you do like normal flips? Like what type of like deals are these? So out of the hundred houses, you know, I'll do about 70% or 70 of those houses. I will sell to my buyer on a seller finance note. Mm -hmm. And I'll carry that note for 30 years at 10%, no balloon. So I am a mortgage company. I collect on hundreds and hundreds of mortgages every month. I average $500 positive cash flow per mortgage. Beautiful. So I have about, you know, it's hard to tell because every day someone pays you off, whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And they, and my people don't pay off because they refinance. They pay off because they move and they list the house with a realtor and the realtor finds a new buyer with a new loan. And then they're calling me for a payoff. That's because my people are inherently flawed. They're never refinancing or they wouldn't be paying 30 years, 10% to begin with. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, it's hard to get over 300 notes in your portfolio because every time you put 20 in, like 15 of them pay off that month. It's a horrible problem because it's quite a windfall for every one of them, you know, because every one of them still owes me 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 or 80,000, if not 100,000. So everyone's always paying me off. So you get these big, you know, but I'm trying to, I was trying to get the 500 notes, but you just can't hardly get past 300. But just take 300. Just take 300 notes times $500 a month positive cash flow. And I'm the land, I'm the mortgage company. I'm not the landlord. So if the air conditioner breaks, it's not my house. It's their house. Don't call me about the air conditioner or the toilet or the hot water heater or the roof or the fence or anything. Because it's not my house. I sold it to you on payments. Yeah. So 500 times $500 times 300 mortgages, that's $150,000 a month cash flow with no phone calls. Pretty sweet deal. Pretty sweet deal. So just so, because a lot of the folks in my, in this group here are newer. So like they, they're still working on the first deal. Like they've been thinking about it for a while, or maybe they do a couple of deals consist inconsistently, but want to take it to the next level. Can you kind of explain a little more about the seller finance? Like, how are you able to buy these properties? Um, how are you able to like, what's your exit strategy? Like, yeah, what I'm going to, I'm going to give it, I'll give a real life example with some Please. numbers. Um, maybe the numbers are a little um, low right now because housing prices have gone up in the last year or so pretty drastically, but, but go with the theory. And then please don't let me forget. I'm talking about these big numbers. I'm talking about all this stuff. We, you don't need to be big. And, and, and if we're talking to people who are just starting out trying to find their first deal, I want to address that because it's a whole different issue. And we all started there. Yeah. So which one do you want to do first? You want to, let's, let's address the small thing. Let's first. address it. Yeah. Okay. So just like I said, reading Robert Allen, you know, he had the audacity to suggest that that I didn't have to have money to become very, very successful, yeah. if not wealthy, in the real estate industry. And I didn't have to have any money. And that was like the audacity of this man, you know? Yeah. What in the world could he be talking about? Uh, but I latched on to the title, Nothing Down, because, you know, if nothing could buy some shit, I had a ton of it. I had a ton of nothing. I could buy the whole town. I was so broke, you know? I might, you know, so what happens is, if you want to simplify things, and that's what I really need is I'm a simple man. I'm not a genius. I, I just have a ton of common sense and I am able to break things down into their simplest components so I can understand them. And then so it's not so complicated so I won't give up or quit. So here it is in a nutshell. We all started broke. We needed money. We'd never, none of us would be here. 99.9 um, .9 of us. When you start out your professional deal maker, let me just ask the whole audience right now. You think you could come up with a hundred million dollars right now? Everyone will say no, right? Yeah. Hell no, not just no, but hell no. I mean, are you crazy? All right, but what if, what if I taught you how to go out and get things under contract for half price and you went out and got a $200 million building downtown under contract for a hundred million? Do you think you could get the hundred million now? Because so, yeah. when you don't have any money, all you are is a professional deal maker, contract writer upper. Yeah. Is that a word? <laughs> it is now. We'll make it a word. Yeah. yeah. That's Seriously, your job. It's, it's our podcast. We can do whatever we want. So we've now deemed the word contract writer uppers. That's what you are. You have to learn how to find great deals at, at super, super, super prices or values. And then you got to learn how to contract it up professionally enough so that it sticks and that you would control of that property for a certain amount of time while you're trying to find the money. And how you find the money is who would like to make 
half of 100 million. And everybody raises their hand and say, great, which one of you can bring 100 million to buy this property? And I'll share the other 100 million with you 50-50. The guy who writes the contract, who has the contract is in control. He's the most powerful guy in the whole situation. Doesn't have a damn penny to his name, but he's got this contract on this $100 million building for $100 million. And people should be fighting to, to, to be the one that I pick to partner with. Because there's $100 million on the table. Yeah. Okay, so let's bring it down to houses. So you buy a house for 250. You know, you got a house for, for 200 that's worth 350. You know, who wants to make 150,000? Great. Bring the, the 200 or the 250. Yeah. You know, well, I'm not going to give you 50. Good, move along. I'll find someone else. No, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, no, go ahead. Just sit over there. I'm going to go find, talk to some other people. Hey, who's got 200 grand? You want to give me 50% or not? No? Okay, let me keep talking. Okay, you do. Okay, here you go. You know, I'm in control. I say when this deal happens. I say how much I get. I say how much you pay. I say I have the contract. So that's the bottom line. So how much money do you need to write a contract? I don't know. Can you buy a ballpoint pen? <laughs> yeah. You can borrow a pen too. Yeah. Yeah. Steal one. Shit. You're paying back here. <laughs> uh, so I like, I like how you addressed it because it's not about the money. It's about the deal. And you need to be a professional deal writer upper. And I like that word. We'll, we'll trademark it. Um, can you run us through like an average transaction just so people can understand like the mechanics um, like what is seller finance? Like understanding what that looks like. Yeah. One more thing though, before we part the subject. Sure. And it doesn't matter about your credit or if you speak the language good or you're too tall or you're too fat or you're too skinny or you're too young. Charles Manson should be able to get this money from prison. Okay. <laughs> it's a good no deal. one gives a crap how many people he murdered. You know, there's a hundred million dollars on the table and uh, you know what I mean? So, yeah. so the biggest objection I, I hear when I, you know, I have a course called Private Money Changes Everything. It's not a very bulky course. It's not heavy. It's not thick. It's just rich. You know what I mean? And one of the main things you got to do is get people to get rid of their limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. And a really good coach, that's what they do. Because once you get one person who even loans you only 20000 or 30000 for a mobile home or something, anything, once that gate gets opened, you'll own the concept in your heart forever. And then it's Katie bar the door, man. You're going to, you know, you're off. You do it one time. Just the same thing the first time you did a wholesale. It doesn't matter how much money you make on a wholesale. Just make, I don't care if you make $3,000, $1,000, dollars $5,000. Just make some money for the first time on a wholesale deal and get your wife and you to go, whoo, it worked. Yeah. You know, your spouse and you. All right. So a, a deal. Let's say um, I find a deal for 50. Uh, first thing you got to do is you got to know how to assess value because you can't buy anything at a discount if you don't know what you can sell it for. Okay. I like so that. You got to start with what is it worth? I mean, what can I sell it for? Not even what it's worth right now, but what can I sell it for if it's in the same condition as everything else around here that sold? It's this comps, right? But I don't go by, I'm doing, I'm, I coined the, the OFV, the owner financed value. There's the ARV, there's the Mayo. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one that used the OFV and I use it all the time and it's starting to catch on. Oh, um, how do you arrive at the owner finance value? The owner finance value is a value unto itself. It doesn't give a damn about what the comps are. It doesn't give a damn about what the houses around there sold. It's not based on solds. It's based on the rent because the concept is a guy paying $1,200 a month rent would rather own right across the street in the same, the same exact house, give or take a couple, for $1,200 a month. If he can own principal interest taxes insurance for $1,200 a month, most renters would rather trade, right? If they're going to pay $1,200 a month, they'd rather pay to own, right? Yeah, ownership, yeah. Well, I mean, not 100% of, there's never 100% of anything. But, so, but the vast majority... You know, I don't know if it's 85% or 75% or 93% of the renters would rather own if it was the same per month. I don't know what it is, but we all know it's high, right? Did you know that that 100% uh, of all the statistics are made up on the spot? <laughs> I've heard um, that before, yeah. So, um, so you take the rents and you subtract the monthly taxes and insurance from the, from the rent. And that tells you what this renter has for P&I. Yeah. Because you know what I mean? The rent doesn't belong to you or him or anybody. It belongs, I mean, the taxes and the insurance, they belong to those guys, right? So you got to take that off the top. So let's use some real numbers. You got eight fit, you got a thousand dollars rent. I'm just using these numbers because I know yeah. I know I know I know the math. 
in my head. You subtract 150 and you're left over with 850 that this renter has for principal and interest. And that's gotta be the payment. Yeah. The principal and interest payment. So I like to use, you know, I sell my houses at 30 years, 10%. Mm -hmm. Now you could take eight, you could go find a, a, a calculator, a, a mortgage calculator. And you could, you know, there's four variables in a mortgage calculator, um, uh, term, rate, um, payment, and, and, uh, and balance, and balance, right? So you got 850 you plug in as the principal and interest payment. You got 10% you plug as, as the interest rate. And you got 30 years as the term and you solve for the balance and whatever that is, that's how much you can borrow at 10% for 30 years and have an 850 payment. Or you could just multiply by 115. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not gonna be exact, but it'll be close enough in houses or, or formulas under 300,000, okay? Mm -hmm. It'll be close enough. You just round off to the highest thousand, whatever's in your favor. So if you take 850 and multiply it by 115 or plug it into this calculator, you're gonna come up with $97,750 is what this guy can borrow at 10% for 30 years to have an 850 p and payment. Okay. To me, that's a lot like 98,000. I always round off, I always round off in my favor, okay? Because okay. I'm in control again. So 98,000, that's what they can finance. If he can afford to finance 98,000, what does that make the sales price or the owner finance value or the OFV? I always add, you know, I, I want no less than 10% down for someone to move into my house. So I would add 10% on top, but I don't like to ask for the minimum that I will take. So I'm going to add 12% on top and I'm in 12% of, of, of 98,000 added to 98,000 is comes out to a number that looks really close to 110,000. That's the owner finance value. And I don't give a crap what the CMA says. In the recession, the CMA was saying, you know, because all the all the banks had closed, nobody was getting a loan. All the comps in the lesser sides of town were like 27,000 in my neighborhood, really, in San Antonio, Texas, right back there. That's the skyline. In 2008, 2009, prices had fallen back to 15 years ago, back to 1996 and 95 and 97. Uh, because people were paying cash for these little houses because banks and cash prices are always low prices. So they were paying $27,000 for these little three, two houses on the lesser sides of town. The rent said I could sell these houses for 59,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. There was 30 comps in the neighborhood saying 27,000. There's no dispute that if you go by the traditional comps, by a broker's professional opinion or by a MA, MAI appraiser's a appraisal or a current market analysis from a realtor, it's going to come in at 27,000, no doubt about it. But the rents, when no one can buy a house, what do people have to, what kind of house they have to move into? They have to move into rent houses. When there's a lot of pressure put on rents, what happens to rents? So when recessions or depressions, there's a lot of pressure put on rents uh, because no one can buy anything. And even if they wanted to, the banks are closed. So the rents are going up and the rents say, I can sell this house for 59,000. So I put the sign up for 59,000. Every now and then a realtor shows up with one of my potential buyers unannounced to me. And the, and the realtor goes, you know, Mitch, you're, you're ripping these people off. The comps are qu clearly $27,000 in this neighborhood. Look, I printed them out. I said, I'm already aware of the comps. If the man has cash or can get a new loan from someplace, you need to buy one of those houses for damn sure. But if he can't, then he's paying $1,200 across the street. And I'm offering a chance to pay $1,200 to own. Now, what do you want to do? The only separator is, do you have, and I asked for 12% down, do you have 12,000 down? And he can buy my house for 110,000. The house isn't worth 110,000. I said, it ain't worth 110,000 to you because you can get a new loan. This man can't get a new loan. I see. Yeah. You know? So, so I borrow 50,000. So I know I can sell this house for uh, say 100,000. I always shoot for 50%. When I go in to buy a house, I'm always the first words out of my mouth are 50% or less. Okay. You know why I like to buy houses at 50%? You know why I was going at 50%? Because I can divide by two like a mofo, man. I, mean, <laughs> I can divide by two so good. Yeah. If you tell me I need to offer 65% of the value, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I have to get my calculator out, you know, like what's 65% of this number, but I can divide by two really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a joke, Victor. Uh, I got you. I'm with you. Yeah. So, so, but I always go in. So, and, and, and a lot of times I buy my house or I can sell or finance my house for a hundred percent over 
what I have in it. That's really my goal. I will go up to 65%, but I don't go any more than that typically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but I always start at like 50 or less. So you got this house, a hundred thousand dollars say. I, I, I get it under contract for 50. That's all in. I borrow 52. Why do I borrow 52? Closing costs. What? No, I'm saying I'm all in rehab, closing costs, everything is, is, is 50, but I borrow 52 because it probably cost me $2,000 to find this guy who would sell me a hundred thousand dollar house at 50,000. And if I leave $2,000 laying around in every house I do, and I do a hundred houses a year for the last 20 years, I'm leaving 200,000 a year in advertising laying in houses. Mm -hmm. You do that, you know, two or three years in a row and you're in, you know, a five years, you do it five years, you got a million bucks you left laying around. Mm -hmm. Who's got a million bucks to leave laying around? No. <laughs> so I replenish my 2000 books, my advertising. And I, so I borrow 52, my payments around, I borrow it at 8% interest only from a okay. private lender, collateral yes. only one lender, one borrower, me, one piece of collateral. And I either pay as agreed, or I have to hand them the deed to my property. That's my promise. You'll never have to sue me for it. If I can't make the payment, I will walk it to you, which by the way, has never happened in my life. Never been foreclosed on, never, never signed a deed in lieu, never filed chapter seven, chapter 13, chapter anything uh, by the grace of God and, and a lot of self-policing. Okay. And, and every now and then just some plain ass check writing when I was upside down, I just wrote a check. Mm -hmm. uh, so my payments around 350, then I go sell it for a hundred thousand with 10% down. So I collect 10,000 down. I don't have any money in this deal. So when I get 10,000 down, that's my money. Yeah. Okay. That's how I pay my bills, make my car payment, make my house payment, take my wife out to dinner, go see a movie. Okay. Yeah. If you do that two times a month, you're making 20 grand a month. If you do it eight times a month, like I do, it's 80,000 a month in down payments. Okay. Then I got this $90,000 note that I made to my buyer or that my, my, my buyer made to me mm -hmm. signed. And he owes me for 30 years, 90,000 at 10%. He owes me about 850. Mm -hmm. So he sends me 850. I pay my 350. I got 500 in the middle. It's my money. If the check cashes, it's my money. Because mm -hmm. if anything breaks, it's not my house. It's his house, right? Okay. Yeah. So I got paid $10,000 to up my monthly cash flow 500 a month. Mm -hmm. And I give my, my $52,000 private lender a first lien on that property. Okay. So if I don't pay, he steps into my position, which mm -hmm. means he's collecting on 850 at 10% a month. You know what I mean? 90,000. Or if that guy's not paying, then he gets the hundred thousand dollar house. Yeah. Uh, uh, for his fifty-two thousand dollars investment, it seems reasonably, um, it seems reasonable that he should be able to get made whole, right? Mm -hmm. Even in a bad time. Yeah. Why, well, especially prices, like would, have, prices would have to drop forty-eight percent before the house was worth what what he had in it. Yeah. You know, so 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 that's the whole thing in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. I really like it because like your upside is so huge. Like you can you know own an asset, uh, very little money. Um, like you get a paid a huge down payment, you get monthly cash flow. Like that's a huge upside, just even doing one deal. And like your downside is extremely minimal. Like what's the absolute worst case that happens when you just hand over the the property to the you know private money lender? So there's that, that's never happened. The worst thing that's happened yeah. to me is the guy inside the house quit paying. So I paid an attorney 800 bucks or whatever and waited 60 days or 90 days until he mm -hmm. moved out. And then I collected, you know, now the house is worth, cause it's been a couple of years. Now the house is worth 115 mm -hmm. and I picked up 15,000 down and I sold it to another guy. Mm -hmm. and, and I stretched down, I started over 30 years instead of 28. That's the worst that's ever happened to me. I mean, but potentially the worst thing can happen is you're going to hand an asset over to a private lender. He's not going to be your lender anymore probably. Because mm -hmm. doctors and lawyers and old people and retired don't know what to do with the house, even though it makes perfect sense. You start handing back houses to people, no matter how good a deal they are, most of your private lenders petrifies the hell out of them mm -hmm. and causes them great stress that they're going to screw up and make 50000 instead of, you know, 350 this month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, but you'll, you know what I mean? You'll run them off if you start handing them assets back. So how do you think about yourself? Do you think of yourself like I'm a, I'm a wholesaler, I'm a flipper? Do you think of, I'm just a bank? Do you think of yourself as a bank? Like, how do you think of yourself? If yeah, you had to give yourself be the bank, bank, Stephen. Or, or Stephen I'm a bank. seller financier. 
Seller financier, yeah. I'm a seller financier, but people, people, um, sophisticated people that you tell them what you're doing, they go, oh, you're a bank. So, 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 you're the so, bank or you're the mortgage company. You're the are. bank. They'll say you're the mortgage company first and they go, no, you're the bank behind the mortgage company. Yeah, yeah I am the bank. The only, you know, uh, so I really like the strategy. You know, I wrote, I wrote three books, but I wrote this one book, uh, My Life in a Thousand Houses of the Art of Owner Financing. Seller financing, owner financing, same thing. Um, uh, you know, the book is 50 bucks. You can go to my website and get it for maybe a little bit less. But sometimes people, you know, it's only what? Um, it's a, it's 200, and, just over 200 pages. And people go to me like, why the hell is this book 200 bucks? And I always say the same thing. I say, you know, set the book down. Okay, move, move, move away from it. You're not ready for this book. You know, this book's worth a million freaking dollars. Yeah. When I say I'm a multi, 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 on and on millionaire, I am. Because every time I create a mortgage and get paid 10 or 15 or 20,000 bucks for a down payment, they still owe me 180,000, 100, 200,000. They still owe me 300,000. It goes on my, it's in my financial. I'm owed the money, mm -hmm. you know? So this is where the wholesalers are, 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 you're killing yourself. By the way, you're a landlord. Uh, what do you get for a down payment? What, what, what do these people give to you before they move in the house? Well, I mean, they just give you maybe first to last month's maybe secure deposit. Hey, that's, that's even worse than what I thought you would say. The first and last months means when they quit paying you, they can stop paying you two months in advance and you have nothing for to, to, to do the repairs with because it's the two months that they already paid for. It should be first month's rent and a deposit equal to one month's rent. So at least you have that for the damages. But what's the average rent you're charging? Uh, around here, like a 1000 bucks would be okay, about Okay, so average. you're getting 2000 bucks. Mm -hmm. okay? Of which the first 1000 is something they owe you for the first 30 days anyway. So you're really not, you have this, and it's in limbo, right? Yep. You know, I asked for 10% down on a $100,000 house, that's 10,000. Sometimes yeah. people will bring me $30,000 on a $100,000 house. What's what's my payment, Mitch, if I give an extra 20,000 down? Well, let me do it. Oh, I want that payment. I, you know, I brought my money from Mexico. I sold my house or I sold my other house. I don't want it to disappear. I want to, I want to get it off out of my account, away from my wife. I want to bury it in this house. I mean, when was the last time you went to rent a house and someone gave you $30,000 that you didn't have to give back? Never. This is I a wish. possibility yeah. every day of my life. Yeah. I've had people give me 50% down. Mm -hmm. Okay. By the way, if someone gives you 30, 40, or 50% down, you think you can liquidate that note with no discount? Absolutely. Okay, mm -hmm. hey, so here's the thing. You wholesalers, I'm about to make you sick, and I don't mean to do it on purpose, but I just want to make you think. What, what's the average wholesale amount that you collect? Do you have a number, Victor? Uh, I don't do any wholesaling anymore. I'd say about five grand assignment. Okay, I was going to say between five and 10. So I was going to say eight grand. I'm picking up about that or more in my down payment. And these people still owe me 180,000 at 10% out in the future. Mm -hmm. So all you wholesalers, because you have not learned to raise private money that is a certain color and a certain texture that works with this kind of strategy, because you will not or have not learned that, that talent and that skill, you're leaving $180,000 to $200,000 on the table with every friggin' transaction you do. So my, <laughs> I'm not doing this to sell a course because I really don't care if I sell a course or not, but for $997, I can get you on the path to figuring that out. And all you got to do is get one person to loan you 30 or 50 or 40 or do one deal with some borrowed money. And 997 looks like $997 looks like chump change. Let's call it a thousand. I hate it when they do that 999. Hell, it's a thousand bucks. You know, for a thousand bucks, let me change your belief system because I have $26 million of private money right now. Non-recourse, collateral only. If the whole world goes to hell, I got to print about 300 uh, deed and lose and I'm done. They can't touch me. You know, my credit's still good. They can't take my $10 million worth of self storages. They can't take my house. They can't take my ranch. They can't take nothing. Mm -hmm. Spoken like a real Texan. I can't take nothing. Can't take anything. So, I wouldn't take it, um, yeah. you know, the reason why though, it's not all uh, uh, like I want to be able to cut and run. That's not the reason. If I'm going to pay you eight and nine and 10%, 
with a maximum of 65% loan to value, with a maximum exposure of 65% to your deal. You know, you have to share in some of the risk of this world with me. You don't get to make eight or 9% for nothing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I am only asking you to, to share in the catastrophic risk of the United States economy. If some, if Kim Jong Young dumbass drops a dirty bomb in downtown friggin' San Antonio and radio activates a, a 20 mile or 30 mile radius, guess what? You're not going to come out very good. But if you want to take that risk, wow. I'll pay you eight or nine or ten percent. Okay. But if that happens, and this is why I did it, it is not friggin' Mitch Stevens' fault. It's nothing I did wrong. So I'm not, I don't want to be held responsible for shit that I can't control. So for eight, I'll pay eight or nine or 10% to be relieved of that. You know, when you go to the bank and you sign for three and a half percent, you know, if Kim Jong dumbass drops that bomb, they don't care. They're taking everything you own. I'm willing to pay double what I could get from a bank to relieve myself of catastrophic, which means I will forever own my assets that I don't, that I don't have a lean on mm -hmm. forever. I like it. So it's a, it's That's a how I can sleep at night owing $26 million because I'm going to collect, you know, I got to make payments on $26 million, which is like $150,000 a month on the first of every month. But I collect 300,000. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if I'm a good steward of that extra 150,000 every month and I go put it into some forever strategy, because notes, uh, flips are one time cash, notes are temporary cash. You got to take the money that you make from flips, the one time cash, and temporary cash, uh, um, seller finance deals. You got to take that money and you got to put it into something forever. Mm -hmm. My forever strategy was self storage, dry dock, uh, dry, uh, dry boat storage household storage, covered parking, open parking, semi-parking, you know, I rent you a little space for you to put your vehicle or your boat or your stuff in, okay? It's the least, and, and I have 1,300 people that owe me 100 bucks a month for that storage space, so do that math. 1,300 times 100 is $130,000 a month that I'm collecting. Yeah. That's what I did with the money I made from these mortgages. You know, I put it into that forever play so that I could eventually work myself out of a job and not have to do mortgages anymore. I just got to manage the manager who's managing my storage, mm -hmm. which is the easiest rental property in the world to manage, in my humble opinion. So um, for you wholesalers out there, any of you guys, Imagine being able to buy any deal you wanted, not having to split it with a partner, not having to pay hard money rates with only six months before you have to get the deal done and having to get out. You know, I borrow my money five years, seven years, 15 years. It's always a 15 year am typically nowadays. I used to borrow just 8% interest only for five years minimum. Um, if you want to know, and then I'd sell my houses on 30 year fixed notes. It would take it would take 17 years usually before their balance got to be equal to my balance. And there's a lot of things you can do with these notes and everything before 17 years. If you want to know how I avoid that train wreck where I have five year money and I'm selling on 30 year money, you can go to my blog at 1000houses.com, 1000houses.com and read the blog why I borrow at the terms I do. But nowadays, I don't need I have plenty of cash flow so I can afford to pay some principal along with my interest, which will cut my cash flow a little bit, but I don't, I've got plenty of cash flow now. So I like to go 15 year notes, mm -hmm. 15 year note. You want to loan me 15 years, flat amortization, fully amortized. I pay you 8%. You want to loan me 15 years with a 10 year balloon. I'll pay, I'll pay you seven and a half percent. You want to loan me 15 year amortization with a seven year balloon. I'll pay you 7%. You want to loan me 15 years with a five-year balloon? I pay you 6%. You know, and I can move this any way I want. I'm just like trying to give three choices to get the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. You know, I always advertise, you know, and there are situations I'll do 10%. You know, I pay you 10% if you'll give me the money for five years, but with no payments for a year or two. This is where I go buy ranches or something. And I got, I need, I need months and months to straighten them out. And, but I don't have to make any payments. And then when I sell it, I'll, I'll pay you your principal back plus your interest, but it's going to accrue so that I don't have any payments. And I'm willing to pay 10% for that. I always average, I always advertise that I pay 10% with, 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 for a 65% loan to value loan. Mm -hmm. Who's interested? They call and I say, 
I'm 15 year am or whatever, no payments for two years. And they go, no, I don't want to do that. So hold on. You know, I'm 8% if you want to do this. You don't want to do that long? Okay, hold on. Well, how about if you want to go seven yeah. years? No, you don't want to do that? Well, hold on, don't leave yet. So I use the 10% to bring people in. I tell them what the 10% rules are. Most of the people don't want that, but they've already raised their hand and called me and exposed themselves. I've got them now because of the 10%. And I explained to them what the 10% rules are. 90% of the people don't like the 10% rules. You know, the, the loan, the terms and everything. Mm -hmm. But that's what I use to get them in the door. Now I can start talking to them about the other plans I have that are shorter time. Of course, I don't pay quite as much interest for the shorter time periods, but you know, that's the whole point. So if, and you guys that are wholesaling, learn how to raise private money. I mean, if you buy my course, private money changes everything, or you buy someone else's, you know, uh, money's not my issue. What I'm looking for is the emotional reward of being part of helping people change their, the trajectory of their life. You know what I mean? And in my coaching and everything, that's really what I'm in it for. So if someone calls for my coaching one-on-one -on -one or whatever, I'm going to have like a 45 minute conversation with you. And if I don't think we're going to go to the playoffs or, or have a chance to win the Super Bowl, I'm not even going to take you because I don't, I'm not doing it for the money. I'm doing it to be on a winning team. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. A lot of those people that play in the Super Bowl, you would, didn't even have to play them. We wouldn't have even had to really pay them to play in the Super Bowl. They would have went to the game and played for free because that's what their passion is, right? Well, I, I, I got to, you know, it sounds cliche, but at some point, you know, money, you have enough money, at least for me. You know, uh, if I got another million dollars tomorrow, it ain't going to change where I live. It's not going to change what I drive. It's not going to change what I eat. It's not going to change anything. So I need something else now. I got to do things for a higher reason. And that higher reason is, to actually have people like what happened, you know, one has happened before in my life. Someone drives 500 miles to knock on my door that didn't even call or didn't even ask if I was going to be there. And they not, and, and, and I answer the door and they go, are you Mitch Steven? And of course they know because of videos. They go, you're Mitch Steven. I say, yeah. They say, I just wanted to come here and shake your hand. And if I could give you a hug because I just quit my job yesterday and my whole life is completely different and you're the reason why. That's why I do it. You know, he cries, I cry. I asked him to come in. He goes, no, I got to go back. I just drove here to this one thing. So uh, you know, that's the reason why. Really having a real impact on people. Because the reason it's so important to get people to quit their job is because the minute a man quits his job, if he's a responsible man who takes pride in what he does, he's freed up about 2,600 hours a year that now he can devote to himself. And so maybe you're only making $3,000 a month or $3,500 a month or $4,000. The sooner you can figure out how to, and that's the only goal you need in the beginning. You don't need a million dollar goal or a $10,000 a month goal. What are you making per month? That's your goal. Because as soon as you find a way to make that $3,500 a month come in that you've been making from your job, you no longer have the job. So now you've freed up 2,600 hours so you can spend time with Victor or Mitch or whoever the hell you want to and start figuring out who you're supposed to be in this life. And then when you figure out what you really want to do, how to put your 10,000 hours in, or in my case, my 80,000 hours, and become the best in the world at it. You know, and immerse yourself. Very cool. I think that's a really good transition. Um, like how can folks, I think you mentioned it, but I want to um, segue here. Like how can folks get a hold of you? Like where can they get access to your course and how can they learn more about you if they're interested? Yeah, yeah. Um, just go to 1000houses.com, 1000houses.com. I was putting out a 10 minute YouTube episode um, every single work day for the last nine months. You can go to, you know, it's over there, 1000houses.com forward slash YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, 1000 houses forward slash podcasts with an S plural to get to my podcast where I'm about to interview my 500th person. You know, I have 500 archive interviews there. Um, you know, if you want to loan me money, just call me. We'll have a conversation. See if we're a nice fit. 210-669-4020. If you want to have that conversation, never any pressures. I'll just, you know, show you what's going on. Send you a couple example deals. I mean, there's never any pressure on anything, whether you're calling about coaching or you're calling about lending money or whatever. I, I just want to see if there's a natural fit. I got over, I got over trying to squeeze round pegs into square holes a long, long time ago. A long time ago because that's where all my trouble was mm -hmm. trying to force things yeah 
wasn't working. Well, as we as we wrap up here, so a thousand houses.com and you have all those forward slashes, floor slash podcasts, you know, et cetera. So a thousand houses.com. Awesome. I'll drink the drop the link below as well. Um, as we wrap up here, Mitch, like any any final thoughts, any final words of wisdom for people getting started? Just um, like any final, you know, nuggets of wisdom here. You know, get as much as you can free from the internet. Watch as many of these strategies as you can. There's a whole lot of them, and that's part of the problem because you can get information overload real easy. But be aware, kind of look at everything from 10,000 feet, every strategy, you know, look from, from real high up. Then find a strategy that you like and that'll work in your market. Not every strategy works everywhere. Seller financing doesn't work in Los Angeles and it doesn't work in New York and it doesn't work in a lot of places where the houses are too expensive or the laws are too slanted towards the um, consumer yeah. where you don't have any rights as an owner. Um, then narrow it down. And then when you find the one strategy that you're sure of, then maybe pay for some courses and start drilling down specifically right on that forsake everything else. Don't look sideways again. And then when you are positive that you have drilled down and gotten all the free stuff or all the nominal uh, affordable courses or whatever, and you're sure it's what you're going to do, then that's when you hire a coach that A, is actively doing what you want to do right now, and is B, is in a place of being successful enough that you would like to be in his shoes. And then last but not least, that that mentor is someone you would like to be on and off the field, personally and business-wise. And if you find, then when you find those things, write the check to that guy. And it needs to be reasonable, but knowledge can be reasonably expensive. So understand that. I mean, I'm 25,000 bucks, but if I can't, if I don't think I can get you back your 25,000 bucks or I can show you where you're missing some things where you're stepping over 25,000, I don't want your money. But because you're either going to pay the street or you're going to pay a mentor. And the street's relentless and it'll take everything you have and there's no end to how much it'll take. Uh, you know, a, a mentor should calm you down. Uh, they should not only help you make money, which you could measure by, but they could help you avoid losing money, which you'll never be able to measure that because you can't measure the negative. And between those two things, it should be a lot less anxiety uh, moving into your success because you'll have someone to bounce things off of. You know, like when, and, and also make sure that you understand who's going to be coaching you because sometimes you can pay these big box guys and then they sub you out to a person that's trying to find their first deal too, oh. <laughs> or they've done 10 deals in their whole life. And I know this is true because I have people call me all the time and say, you know, I paid this guy to coach. And then when I asked the person that I was talking to on the phone, like, well, how many deals have you done? They said, well, they're trying to find their first deal too. It's like, I paid, you know, $15,000 to talk to a person that hasn't bought a house that's reading out of a book, you know? Like, so if you hire me, you get me, mm -hmm. you know, I got 27 years. When you start telling me about your buyer and how the conversation's going, you know, the hair starts to stand up on the back of my neck. And I say things like, all right, Victor, hold on right there. I don't want to talk about this guy anymore until you do something. Go get a shovel, go to the back left-hand corner of that lot that that house sits on. I want you to dig a four foot deep hole, four foot wide, four foot square four foot deep and call me back. And then Victor calls me back and says, how in the hell did you know that was buried back there? And I said, cause I've talked to this asshole before and I've talked to a lot of them that have tried to do this to me. And it's always the same thing. It's always that same crap buried in that same hole in the same place. That's what I think. I thought this guy was trying to do it to you and lo and behold, I'm right. Aren't I? Okay. This is how we handle this. You know, H how do I know that? It's not because I'm brilliant. I've just been doing the same damn thing for 27 years. I got 2,000 deals that worked out. I got thousands of deals that didn't work out because I found that stuff in the back left-hand corner and canceled the deal. Yeah. You know, So make sure when you hire a coach, who you're going to be talking to. It's all right for you because you're only paying a little bit that you talk to an underling. That's great. But if you're paying a lot and you're not talking to the guy with all the experience, maybe that shouldn't sit so good with you. Yeah, spot on. 
Well, awesome. I think that's really good advice, not just like what to do in real estate, but like what to look for in a mentor and like why you should go mentorship and why you shouldn't type of thing. Uh, I think it's a really great framework. So again, I appreciate you taking the time, Mitch. This has been fantastic. Um, I dropped the link below thousandhouses.com for folks who want to check this out, check uh, Mitch out. Uh, Mitch is the real deal. And uh, not a lot of people can say they've done over 2000 deals. That's a uh, uh, that's pretty rare. So to be able to learn from someone like that is uh, is a treat in and of itself. So again, appreciate you taking the time, Mitch. Victor, thanks so much. A pleasure being on here. Awesome. Sounds good. Appreciate it.